too. So, without further ado, oh gosh, Paul Rose, international man of intrigue, explorer, secret agent, not so secret anymore, PDC commentator, he's a science supporter, whereas he's not necessarily a scientist, but he's on the front lines of science wherever it happens all over the world in uh, a capacity with film, uh, with helping out and uh, bringing forth a lot of these frontline field studies. The possibility of being in the wild places, it's got, it's, it's double-edged sword, isn't it? It means you have to live by that. And there's nothing like it when clients are paying you big money and you have to stand in front of them and say, you know what, we just climbed the wrong flipping mountain. Uh, so, uh, quite obviously we've got this picture, we did go down and we got ourselves recovered and reorganised and did some it about a week, a week later. But it's that sense of freedom and vitality and passion for being alongside nature that, that I want to share with you. And I still have to use, even though I spend all of my time on television, and you'll often find me on, on, on the news talking about global issues such as plastic in the oceans or ocean debris, I still have to use tricks to engage people because not everybody is sitting at home as engaged in nature as I am. You have to, we have to find little tricks, innovative solutions to communicate. Um, I think you must have all seen these kinds of images. You know, these, you know here's, a, here's these plastic sea uh, debris that runs up on, on, in the Philippines. You've seen pictures here, I think, of the Pacific Ocean gyre. And you've certainly seen these images here of albatross and other seabirds in the Marshall Islands of the Pacific. And these birds can't tell the difference between plastic and other small fish and other debris in there. So they eat away and peck away until their guts are full. Well, instead of being full of food, it's full of the things that we all recognise. You know, lighters and bottle tops and all kinds of odd bits of plastic. And they can't survive, so quite obviously there's thousands upon thousands of these dead birds that are full of this plastic. And I, when I tell this to the news or talk about it to large groups such as you, I often think, well, people get it. You know, of course we get it. We get the idea that there's a zillion tons of rubbish going into our ocean. And a lot of that we can't even see. Them. A lot of it degrades, as you well know, and goes into micro pollutants. So how to carry that message? to large groups of people who I think aren't getting it, I realised that we could do a smart thing. And I lived half of the time in Switzerland, and I thought there was value in saying to the public, you know, here's Switzerland, which as you know is a landlocked country, an enclave, providing some leadership for the oceans. And as soon as people start asking that question, that's funny, what's Switzerland doing, getting interested in the oceans? You've got them, because they're asking that question to begin with. So at the Zurich Museum of Design, we went and collected a load of plastic debris from the Hawaiian Islands, the North Sea, and the Baltic. And we cleared up all this plastic, piled it into the main hall that's behind me there. Once we got it all piled up, and this took us an enormous job, you can imagine what it's like to get it in. We then asked the scientists to look at their computer models, look at the remote sensing, and tell us how much that is. And they worked it out and said, well, that's what goes in the sea every 15 seconds. So even if they're off a fair bit, let's say it actually goes, let's say it's 30 seconds, but it might be five, but their best, very good estimate at the minute is 15 seconds. And then down this side of the museum, we put all the, all the um, computer modeling that showed how we know it's 15 seconds. And then down that side, we did big displays as to our, our relationship with plastic. It's a fantastic material, life would be impossible without it. But what do we actually do it once we own these bits of plastic? What, what do we do then, and what's the new technology that's moving forward? Including lovely and innovative ideas that are going on in Europe at the moment, where big companies are paying fishermen to catch plastic. So when fishermen are at sea with their big nets, there's loads of debris that comes up in that net, and they often discard it, of course. Well, now, they're actually paying for the plastic, and these old discarded nets and buckets and everything else go down to the big plant in London, get reprocessed and made into plastic bottles, uh, carpets and clothing. So it's a lovely sort of trick. And in fact, my next television series is about that uh, very subject. In a word, absolutely useless. When in, in Britain at the time, we had an exam called the 11 plus. And what it was, when I was in love with Mike Nelson's women and wanted to be a diver, and that's all I came out a diver, I had to take this exam called the 11 plus. And it was a big filter, a very coarse filter. So you spent a day taking these exams, 
And if you passed, you went to these schools. And if you failed, you went to these schools. And me and all my mates, we were all equally useless. We all failed it and went to all the really bad schools. And it seems, it seems it, it, now looking back on it, it seems incredibly harsh. I mean, you're 11, well, I don't remember much preparation, I hated school, teachers were the enemy. All I wanted to do was be a diver and at some point have a motorcycle. <laughs> so I was certain about a diver and a bit hazy about a motorcycle. Um, absolutely flipping useless. And in them days, you could leave school at 15 if you passed something, anything. And I, I was really good at metal work and still am. So I managed to focus on metal work and uh, uh, I managed to get a metal work ordinary level, as it was called, and passed that thing and I could escape. Right. I, looking back, I was I was in a really bad place when I was 14 because I. All the things, you know, I reacted to the school in a really negative way. I was learning in a really bad way. I hadn't learned how to learn. I hadn't learned anything about myself. And I was just in with a really bad crowd of here, you know, just useless. Um, and at 14, it was a geography teacher who took me and all my useless friends. We all went to the mountains in Wales. And I'd never been. You know, I was growing up in an urban environment. And suddenly, we were in, in the mountains. And I loved it, because this teacher who was, in my little life, part of the enemy, this grey, horrible, miserable geography teacher, the closer we got to the, to the mountains and the hills, which took about three hours' drive, he became an ordinary guy. And he was wearing a you know, Gore-Tex jacket at the moment, and he, was, and he was dead friendly, and he was communicating with us really well. And we spent a week climbing and walking around in really foul weather in Wales. And I absolutely loved it, because I'd never done it before. And I suddenly realised I could do it, I could navigate. I felt, in, I had an intuition as to what might be the safest way out, which would be the fun way down the river. How to cook and camp and get by in the outdoors. And I, we, we stayed in this tiny youth hostel in a place called Merthyr Tidfot. I remember sitting at that youth hostel at night sometimes, peeling potatoes into a bucket, you know, for dinner, thinking to myself, I've never felt so alive. That week changed my life, and I've never felt so alive as peeling potatoes. And, and what I really enjoyed is some of the kids that had gone down there separately, who were the ones you know, who were doing really well in school, were absolutely hopeless in the outdoors. Not all of them, but just some. Oh, what's your, where was your favourite place to go? Oh, where was my favourite place to go? has to be Antarctica, you know, because it, Antarctica is such a very special place. There's no indigenous population. It's a, it really is the white laboratory, the continent for science. And I've had so many firsts there. You know, I set up the diving program. Every, for years, every single dive was a world's first. And can you imagine coming up with the world's great marine scientists and saying, hey, what was that green thing that had these and that? What the hell was it? And they said, you know what, we've got no idea. We have no idea what this stuff is. Fantastic. So, and I've been lucky in, you know, traveling a lot of unclimbed, unnamed, unmapped, unground truth areas in Antarctica. So there's a, there's a lot of me still down there. And in fact, I'll be going down again in November. <laughs>